It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hi, welcome to the show today. My guest is Jeff Shore, author, speaker, sales trainer, sales expert. We're going to talk about a lot of things with good sales background here today. So, Jeff, how are you doing? I am fantastic. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. This is going to be fun. Yeah, this will be a lot of fun. So, you know, rather than me read sort of the standard PR release, I always start the show, let the guest introduce themselves and tell us what you do and who you do it for. Yeah, uh, I'm a sales wonk. I just I love sales. I love picking up the sale, tearing it apart, looking at it, dissecting it. I think it's something that everybody in the sales business uh, should do. And I find it interesting. A lot of people is like, oh, I can't be. I could never be in sales. And you know, I, I'd look at it and go, come on, it's not rocket science. But you you, you surely have to understand uh, how people make decisions. And that's really my take more than anything else. I'm much more interested in the way that people buy. If I can figure out the psychological angles of the way that they buy, then we can much easier figure out how we're going to sell. But, you know, we, I, I've got a nine person uh, training and consulting team spread out uh, all around North America. Um, if, if, uh, 30 years for me in the business, I was national sales director for a very, very large organization. Uh, but now I'm on my own, uh, write some books, give some speeches, uh, talk to experts like you and uh, just generally enjoy life. Good, good. I mean, that's I can't agree with you any more than when you said it's all about the buyer. It is about the buyer, right? Sales is really about, it's a service you provide to the buyer. Understanding how they make decisions, absolutely critical. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I and I'm, my guess is you're, we've never had this conversation, but my guess is that you're probably like me. I, I'm much more likely to read a psychology book than I'm going to read a sales book, right? Yeah, psychology, economics. Yeah. Yeah, really, with the motivations. What motivates people to want to make certain decisions and how sure. they do it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how did you get your start in sales? I, I think I sort of fell into it. I was uh, I was actually in the restaurant business uh, right out of school. Horrible business uh, from my, my perspective. Uh, it's a just grueling, grueling business. I didn't really, really loved it. Uh, it d didn't ever really have the passion for it. Uh, but uh, somebody told me you know, I could make, uh, I don't know, at the time, $40,000 or so selling real estate. I thought, no, nah, get out of town. Nobody makes that much money. Uh, but uh, I decided to uh, get my real estate license and, and sell real estate. I, I fell in love with the real estate business, especially uh, the home building side. And I worked for a large home builder for about 11 years. And you know, from sales, VP of sales, national sales director, ran a division for them. It was, it was, it was great. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, until it was time for me to say, okay, now it's time to step out on my own. But yeah, I'd like to say that you know I, I went and met with a college counselor, and they said, oh boy, we've done all these personality profiles. You should be in sales. I think like most people, sort of fell into it, decided I absolutely loved it, and I, and I think that the, the that the key for me was, you know, I I got in. Uh, to the sales business in, at a time of a very healthy economy. I was doing really well right out of the gate. I was wearing a nice suit. I was driving a nice car. And I would have told you that it was all me. I mean, I know the market had something to do with it, but mostly, right, it was me. You know? and, and then the market just, I mean, somebody just turned off the lights, right, and uh, pulled the carpet out on, from under us. And and that, I really, really struggled. And that's really when I learned how to sell. I made a lot of money in a great market, but I learned how to sell in a tough market. And I'm so grateful now for having gone through that difficult time because it, it was, that was really the start of my career. So what'd you learn? Well, first and foremost, uh, I learned that it's not about me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, early on in the process, I think I would bought into that idea of, you know, the salesperson as superhero. And, uh, you know, over time I had to look at it and say, you know, there, there might be some, um, Yoda like approach as a salesperson, but you got to keep in mind, Yoda doesn't save the world. Luke saves the world, right? So, um, you know, I had to look at it and say, ultimately, it's not about me. It's facilitating what happens. And, and I think the evolution was to say, first, it's not about me. Then to get to the point where saying it's not about my product before I could look at it and say the sale is all about the customer. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's a there was a maturity that had to take place in order to, for me to put that customer centric view of the sale first. Once I did that, then I started to realize that so much of the material out there about sales was about either the salesperson or about the sales, the product that was being sold, but not nearly enough that was focused on how does a customer think that's that's what I'm passionate about. And it's still that way. Sure. 
Yeah. Well, it, it should be for all of us. I mean, if you figure well, out no, how... I'm, I'm saying it's still that way in terms of most of the material you see written for salespeople to try to get better. It's all about the salesperson and not about the customer. Yeah, unfortunately, not enough has changed along those lines. Although, I don't know how you feel about this, but my sense is that the customer is forcing our hand along those lines. I think more and more customers are looking at it and going, no, 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 no. I recognize a trap when I see it. And uh, I just think customers are less likely to be manipulated uh, by a, a smooth sales line than perhaps they once were. What do you yeah. think? Well, I think that's a little bit true. I think they have, given the fact they have access to more information to maybe consider what their alternatives are and what other people are doing, learn what other people are doing and sort of learn lessons from other folks right. than certainly they had in the past, then yeah, I think they're a little wiser and certainly more empowered. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned the information. When I first started selling, I had the luxury of saying to a customer, you can have this piece of information, you can have this piece of, I'm going to hold off on this one over here, right? Now the information, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's all accessible to everybody. And so that, that's the great equalizer now for that customer. But I think the other thing is that there are so many companies that have rewritten the book on sales into a customer-centric approach that it's no longer about just the sales process. It's really about the experience that companies provide for their customers. And I'm on kind of a mini kick right now about that whole concept about how do we move away as, as uh, you know, Joseph Pine and James Gilmore wrote in The Experience Economy, how do we move beyond goods and services and into an experience-based economy. And as we do that, then we recognize if you're going to build a great experience, it has to be customer-centric. It can't be about the company. It can't be about the salesperson. It can't be about the product. It has to be uh, about the customer. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, in so many markets, you know, there's just too many competitors, too much competition. You know, if a customer has to make a decision and they're choosing between 10 different vendors, well, they all look alike. They're just going to choose any one of them, right? So how do you differentiate well, it's through that experience of how you sell and help the customer make a decision. Yeah, even in the in the small little ways, and I, I'm encouraged by this actually that I think more and more companies are figuring this out and providing better experience, even in the small little details. You know, when I when I when I bought a car, I bought an Infinity, and there was a little key ceremony where several people came out to hand me my keys, and when I when I opened the little box that the keys were in, they all applauded. Look, you know, zero cost uh, to the the car dealership, but high emotional value for me. It should be a happy time. Mm -hmm. you know, buying a car. And so when we think about just these, the way that we provide the experiences that are in tune with the way that a customer wants to feel, uh, we're going to, we're going to move a lot farther uh, into the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the acceptance and the appreciation of our customer than we would with any sales line. I can promise you that. Right. So in your writing, you talk about comfort addictions. Yeah. So that hold salespeople back. So explain what you mean by these and how do people overcome them? Sure. Well, you know, it it really started with the idea of, well, like you, evaluating salespeople over the years and trying to figure out, well, you know, everybody tries to unlock the key, what makes for a great salesperson. And I would find salespeople who were, you know, some who were uh, longtime industry veterans who were great at what they did, but others who were, you know, brand new, you know, just off the bus and and, and uh, too stupid to know that they couldn't sell at a very high clip, so they just did it anyway, right? <laughs> Uh, you see right. some salespeople who are extremely outgoing and successful, but then you see some who are rather laid back and introverted and still successful. Some are really smart, some not so much. So they're trying to what's the defining the defining the defining factor here in success. And I think one of the key factors is how we deal with discomfort, because the sales process is rife with discomfort. You you can't. You're never going to have a sales presentation that doesn't have some measure of discomfort somewhere, whether it's in regards to price objections or follow-up or initiating a call or prospecting or, you know, the closing question, whatever it's going to be. Sure. All the way through the process. All the way through. So the question is, what do you do in that moment of discomfort? And what I've learned over time is that we're, we're fighting our own brains. Our brains desire comfort. We want to be comfortable all the time. And so our brain is going to, when we face a discomfort, is always going to look for uh, that easy way out. Daniel Kahneman, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, talks mm -hmm. about the law of least effort. The idea that we're, the brain is an, is an efficient machine. It's always trying to find easy. What's easy? Well, easy doesn't necessarily associate with right. 
Right. So what we find here is that the easy thing is to is to give into that comfort, uh, that desire for comfort, and do the easiest thing. So uh, the, my message here is to look at it and say, every time you face a discomfort, you've got a choice, and it's the quality of the decisions you make at that time of the choice that are going to make all the difference in the world. If we can look at it from the perspective that those discomforts that we face are actually opportunities, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you, that there is no growth without discomfort apart from discomfort, then it changes the way we see discomfort. If I can learn to em embrace that, then I become better and stronger and I can tackle more and more discomfort uh, as I go through not just the sales process, but through my life. So is there an exercise you give people to use to help them learn to how to overcome the discomfort? When I was researching uh, the, this, the book, Be Bold and Win the Sale, um, and trying to get around this concept of boldness, because I think a lot of times people think boldness, they think, you know, slick or manipulative or in your face. And I, I don't see it that way at all. I see it as making the, doing the right thing despite your discomfort. Mm -hmm. What is the right thing to do despite your discomfort? So as I was researching this, I, I really got a deep dive into something that I was already familiar with but became something of a layman's expert on, and that is the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. If you look at comfort addiction, I, I, that's the term that I use, comfort addiction. If you look at the, because it really does have the, all of the principles of a classic addiction. Well, then you ask the question, if you're a psychologist, if you're a profess, professional counselor and you're helping somebody with an addiction, what do you do? The, the most dominant form of therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. Simply apply those principles to what happens when we face the discomfort in the sales process. So the idea here is cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive thinking, behavioral acting, thinking or making a decision before you have to act. So the idea here, if you want to attack your comfort addictions, it's not a matter of how you do it, it's a matter of when you do it. You have to train your brain before you're in that moment of discomfort. Because if you wait until you're in the moment of discomfort to make a decision, your brain will naturally send a message that says, this is dangerous, there's a threat sensitivity, get out, run away. Right. But if I can make those decisions before, if I can train my brain before I face those discomforts, I can make it out of the logical side of my brain to ask the question, not what's the safe thing to do, but what's the right thing to do. So there's a lot of pre-training that goes on in this process in order to prepare for what I know are those inevitable moments of discomfort in the sales process anyway. Right. So is there one little tip you could give to the listeners that they could put to use in their business today to help them with that? Sure. Pay attention to the shutter. We all have these sh what I call shutter moments, those, those, those where we just shiver just a little bit when we hear, you know, the customer says, uh, you know, I, you, you, your competitor is offering this much or less, or that much mm -hmm. of a discount, or, or uh, you know, I need to talk to uh, the decision makers, or, 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 or it, it's time, you know, maybe it's just a voice that goes off in your head that says, this would be a good time to ask for the sale. You know, whatever it is, when you have those shiver moments, those moments that you really don't like in the sales process, the reason you don't like it is because it's uncomfortable. So if you can pay attention to those shiver moments, those shuddering moments, and look at it as an opportunity, just isolate that one thing, just, and start small, but just that one thing for you to look at it and say, okay, when I'm not in the moment, how can I prepare for that before I get in the moment? How can I decide before I'm there what I'm going to do? So that when I hit that moment, when that I get that shiver, uh, it triggers in my brain, oh wait, I already made this decision. I've already played it out in my brain. I already know what I'm going to do. And this starts with just the small discomfort. It's just, a, just gaining confidence. Boldness is like a muscle. You grow mm -hmm. it a little bit at a time, and then you get stronger and stronger and stronger, which, by the way, has been my life's journey over the last boy, five to seven years of just trying to systematically knock out all the comfort addictions in my life. It's been an amazing ride. Very interesting. All right, so let me give you a hypothetical scenario to think about before the break, because we're going to take a break in just a minute. And you'll get a chance to think about it, and then we'll come back and answer it. So fairly common situation, you're a new manager being brought into a company where you know things just aren't happening the way they need to be from a sales perspective. They've made, they've stalled, stagnating a little bit. And you're under pressure to make an impact quickly. So what would you do in the first week you were there that would have the biggest impact? And we'll be back after the break to hear Jeff Shore's answer. Be right back. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, 
to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. Welcome back. My guest today is Jeff Shore. You can catch Jeff online at jeffshore.com. Make sure you pick up his book, Be Bold and Win the Sale. We were just talking about that in the first half of the show. So, Jeff, talk about that scenario I presented before the break. New manager, brought into a company, need to make a quick impact. What are the two things you would do sales-wise in the first week that would have the biggest impact? I said, that's a tough challenge. It really, really is. Um, but when we look at it from the perspective, if we stay with the principles that we were talking about before the break, and we think through, okay, the, I think the first thing that I want to do is ask myself, what makes me most uncomfortable about this scenario? Now, the problem with the, an- with the answer I'm going to give is that it's going to be different for every single person who puts themselves in that situation. So I could come up with examples here, but it really is going to be different every day. I have to start by asking, what am I most nervous about? What am I most concerned about? What is my gr- greatest discomfort in the scenario that I've just described? Hmm. And if I take that into a specific moment, is it walking into a sales meeting for the first time and introducing myself? Is that my greatest discomfort? Is it being challenged by the long-term veteran who thinks that you know he or she has got it already all figured out? Is that my greatest challenge? So I would say that the very first thing we want to do is size up what am I most afraid of? And if I can look at that, the problem is whatever you're most afraid of, you're going to have to deal with at some point. Now the question is, do you want to deal with it now before you get into that moment where you can do it out of your rational, logical mind, or do you just want to put your head in the sand and wait until you're in that moment when you're going to respond to the emotion of fear and probably run away? So the first piece of advice I would give is tackle in advance those moments that scare you the most. Decide now while you can do it out of the logical side of your brain. Mm -hmm. The second piece of advice I would give of that manager moving in is to look at it and just to simply ask the question, who do you want to be? Uh, who, how do you want to be seen uh, by your people? And, and you know, what will happen is that oftentimes uh, managers will go in and they want to make a statement. They, they want to prove that you know, they're in charge or that they're competent or whatever. But that's, that's, all, that's a, such a short-term way to look at things. The question is, how do you want to be seen as a leader 10 years from now at your retirement dinner or 20 years from now, what do you want these people to say about you 20 years from now? That's a very different answer. Mm -hmm. I look at it only from the perspective walking in and saying, how do I prove that I'm in control of this team? Then you're not going to be yourself. You're going to have this sort of false bravado that you carry into the room. But if you look at it and say, what do I want these, these people to say about me at my retirement dinner 20 years from now? That will dramatically change your approach when you walk into that meeting for the first time. Very interesting because you know, through everything you're talking about and, and in your book, Be Bold to, to Win the Sale, is, you know, sales, and this is what I talk about in, in my latest book, is that selling is a deliberate action, right? It's not something you improvise as you go along. And you've really taken it to a great level, which is, you know, even modeling behaviors that you want to execute, either with peers, with subordinates, or with customers, and I think that's an extremely valuable lesson for people to learn is that, yeah, you are going to have these moments of discomfort in your life, even outside of sales. And think about that beforehand and think about how you want to, like I said, the behaviors you want to model when you're in that situation. Yeah, there's a, I'm not much of a Zen guy, but there's an old Zen saying, and it's kind of stupid, there are no new Zen sayings, are there? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I think there probably are, with all the right. emphasis on mindfulness and so on, yes. That's right, okay. Uh, but, the, but the saying is, uh, the obstacle is the path. Right? The obstacle is the path. It, it's, it's not on the path. It's not in the way of the path. It's not something that I need to get around in order to get back on the path. The obstacle is the path. And just a quick story on that, if I could here. I, 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 some people have bucket lists, I, you know, things they want to do before mm-hmm. they kick the bucket. I don't have a bucket list. I have a discomfort list. I have a long list, it's ever growing, uh, of things that I've either always wanted to do but found too uncomfortable or things that I knew that I should do but found too uncomfortable. And I've been systematically attacking that discomfort list over the last several years. 
and applying the principles uh, of boldness in order to be able to to uh, to do that. So one of the things that I, it's going to sound a little awkward, but uh, I've been an ice hockey fan since I was like five years old, but mm -hmm. I didn't know how to ice skate. Well, last year at age 52, I said, you know what? You're not getting any younger and you've always wanted to learn how to play uh, ice hockey. And you don't know how to ice. Hey, how about this? Go learn how to ice skate and go learn how to play ice hockey. So I did it. At 52, I joined this learn to play ice hockey class and I stepped out on the ice the first night and it said for all skill levels, but that was a lie because I didn't know how to skate. So I step out there. Not only am I the oldest guy on the ice, uh, but I'm also the worst skater on the ice. And I got to tell you, it was hor that first night was horribly embarrassing. <laughs> I'm falling all over the place. And about halfway through that class, I'm seriously thinking about faking an injury. I'm totally, I, I'm totally serious. I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm calculating what body part should I grab, yell ow, and just get off the ice, right? Because that my, my desire for comfort says, this is such a horrible situation, get out of it. But because I'm here so intentionally for the purpose of dealing with my discomfort, I knew I could not, I could not walk away. And so I stayed with it. And then Tuesday morning, I was back out there with a private coach saying, all right, look, teach me how to stop. Because right now, if I'm going to stop, I need the wall, the ice, or another human body. Teach, let's start there. Teach me how to stop. And I stayed with it. I stayed with it. I stayed with it. Now I'm playing. I'm, I'm in a league. I'm having the time of my life. We have games on Sunday night. And by, by 5 o'clock, I'm looking at the, at the clock like, is it time? Can I go now? And, and, and I say this by way of encouragement. When you embrace those things that are uncomfortable, when you do those uncomfortable things, it's just amazing, not just in sales, but it's just in life in general. It's just a better life when you do uncomfortable things. Yeah, and for sales, it's just transformative, right? I mean, to, to be able to empower yourself to go where you're afraid to go before is just going to make you so much more effective for really in service of the customer, right? Because, you know, you're there for a reason to help the customer. They're choosing to talk to you for a reason, which is they think that you can help them in some way, some way right? Otherwise, they wouldn't have bothered wasting yeah. the time on you. Right, absolutely. Why would why would you be there? They could, if they could buy it online, they'd buy it online. If they need a salesperson, it means that there is a role. But I think that the that one of the most underrated and underappreciated attributes of great salespeople is the attribute called confidence. And I don't mean arrogance. I don't mean cockiness. But that sense of confidence that that people want to we we. We follow confidence. We pay for confidence. When you think about you know, uh, political leaders, religious leaders, the captain of the sports team, whatever it is, we follow people who are confident. And uh, it, from my direct experience is that when we are bolder to face our discomforts, when we do the things that make us uncomfortable, but we do them anyway, the, the huge benefit there is that it grows our confidence level. We feel stronger. Our customers have more confidence in us. Uh, and now we're, we're able to take on greater and greater levels of uh, discomfort. That's when the Im Im improvement really, really begins. And the sales professionals that I've been blessed to work with on this topic over the last several years have reported back to me over and over again that it's a short-term pain that they have to deal with, but the long-term benefit is really, really powerful. Yeah, because once you've broken that addiction, as you talk about, once you've broken those, that one bad habit, then you're not going back. Yeah. And you can then go attack the next one. Sure. That's exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. Great advice. Um, so you've got a conference coming up. I do. Tell uh, us about that. Yeah. Every year we put on this really, uh, really fun sales leadership summit. We do always do it in cool venues. We were at the Driscoll Hotel in the historic Driscoll in downtown Austin two years ago. Last year we were at uh, Coronado uh, in uh, San Diego. And uh, this year we're in uh, downtown Chicago, September 10th and 11th. Um, and it, it, we're going to be in the Mid-America Club at the top of the Allen Building, 80 floors up with a with a 360-degree uh, uh, view of Chicago. We'll have uh, a great event the night before at uh, a jazz club with a special guest speaker uh, of Chicago and most have heard of by the name of Mike Ditka. We got Mike Ditka to in, uh, come in and speak with us and we're going to have a great time there. And then we'll be spending time, about 300 sales leaders from industries all around uh, North America, uh, breaking down what's the next step in sales leadership. We're calling it level up and the question is how do we take five key areas of our sales leadership uh, efforts and level them all up. How do we how do we get to that next level? And we'll walk away some with some strategic plans. So, what are those five levels of sales leadership? 
a lot of fun, and uh, and it, we're, we're excited about it. Jeffshore.com, uh, it's on the front page. You can see it there. So what are those five five levels of sales leadership to level up? Oh, you're going to ask me to do that off of memory off the top of my head? <laughs> <laughs> don't, give gonna... me, don't give me the age excuse. Yeah, I know. That's exactly. Well, I could. It, it would certainly apply. Uh, we're we're going to look at uh, leveling up the, the culture uh, of the organization. We're going to look at how we level up uh, prop, the profit revenue equation. We're going to look at how we level up the skill set of the salespeople. We're going to look at how we level up our own ca career trajectory. This will be an important question trying to figure out. If if you is if you think about your goals and where you want to be five years from now, is your current trajectory headed in that, that direction? And then we'll talk about leveling up the customer experience. We'll spend a lot of time talking about uh, the this exp the concept of the experience economy and what do we do in in, in very simple, um, transformative and yet not brain damaging ways to build a better experience for our customers. Good. So a very sort of holistic approach to sales. I mean, it's not just sales skills, but it's sales management, leadership, yes, your yeah, professional this, development. Right. This one is really for sales leaders. It's yep. for sales executives and uh, people who are leading sales teams. That's that is the intended audience, and and of course, then the business owners and and uh, uh, you know th th those who who uh, manage sales leaders. Very cool. All right, so our last segment here, we're going to move into what I call the sales corner. I'm going to ask you some rapid-fire questions. You can give me one-word answers, stream of consciousness, or you can elaborate as much as you want. Sounds like fun. Let's do it. So what's the most powerful sales tool in your arsenal? Oh, boy. Uh, it's In my arsenal, it's understanding the way that people make decisions. I mean, I, it's all to me, it's all about the filter through which a customer is going to see the decision-making process. So uh, being, I, liking to, you know, at the risk of sounding arrogant, I like to think of myself as an expert in the way that people make decisions, and that's the most powerful tool that I carry around. Okay. Yeah, the same perspective. I agree with you 100% on that. So name one tool you use for sales management that you can't live without. <laughs> it's the phone call, uh, it, which sounds a, a little bit bizarre, but I, I am just stunned at how we are a nation of comforted uh, addicts who are so in love with text messaging and emails that we forget the power of a voice-to-voice -voice conversation. I agree. Well, and just look how sales is transforming from being sort of a field sales base to increasingly an inside sales base, which is purely phone-based. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you look, if you can't go face-to-face then you got to go voice to voice. Exactly. And, but again, it's a comfort addiction that drives us towards, well, the, it's easier to send an email. It's easier to send a text. This is true. It is easier. And if you're looking for easy, great, go ahead and do it. But if you're looking for effective, pick up the stinking telephone. Who's your sales role model? Uh, <laughs> currently, it's probably um, it's probably Daniel Kahneman. <laughs> okay. But for that, I would say it's it's uh, again as far as the big names, Robert Cialdini. Uh, his work on influence theory uh -huh. is nothing short of of uh, of amazing. Just really great stuff. Yeah, it's a great book for people to read. So, what's the one book that every salesperson should read? Well, if I, I think influence has absolutely got to be a, a a huge part of it. If you're looking at um, sales skills specifically, that's where I would go. Uh, influence. If you're looking at psychology, uh, probably uh, thinking fast and slow. Daniel Kahneman. If you're looking at how you manage your life, the power of full engagement by uh, Jim Lehrer and Tony Schwartz. Okay. Your favorite music to listen to to psych yourself up for an important sales call. <laughs> I've got. I have such a broad musical taste, it, 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 excluding uh, uh, rap and country. I'll listen to just about anything. But uh, for me, it's not the it's it's not the the uh, eye of the tiger type of stuff. For me, it's going to be old school jazz. If if I want to get psyched up, I'll listen to uh, Coltrane or Thelonious Monk or mm -hmm. something out of the, something out of the deep past. What's the first sales activity you do every day? The first sales activity, well, it's it's probably check Red Booth because I'm I'm uh, I, I I'm have I'm distracted by squirrels, and so if I jump on email right away or start looking around at uh, Facebook or anything else, uh, I could go on a rabbit trail for a while. So the first thing that I will do is to ask myself, what did I plan the night before? So that to me, that's the key. I always end my day by making sure my priorities are clear the next morning. Otherwise, I'm reactive. If I, if I want to be uh, preemptive, proactive, I have to decide the night before. So my first sales activity is to say, what's on Red Booth? And that's your organizer? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
So what's your definition of value in sales? Um, value is a buyer word, not a seller word. Uh, we have no, cl no claim as a seller to the word value. Um, so it, it, what that means is then if it's valuable to the buyer, it's valuable. And there's no other way to define it. Okay, I agree. What's your favorite social media tool and why? Oh, boy. Um, this, these are good questions. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I, I admit it. I, I'm a little bit of a Facebook junkie, although I don't post a lot on Facebook. Uh, I, I, I do enjoy the different things that people post, the different articles, the different uh, – and I can kill too much time on it. But, I, yeah, I, I kind of like Facebook. I, maybe that makes me uh, out of touch. I, I know I'm supposed to say Instagram, but I'm going to say Facebook. <laughs> no, I don't think there's any right answer for this one. Okay, all right, fair enough. All right, so the one question you get asked most frequently by salespeople. How do I uh, – boy, well, it's prob it's interestingly enough, it's probably how do I draw more tra – how do I prospect more effectively? How do I draw more traffic? And they never like the answer because my first question – the first response from me is always, well, let's start with the traffic that you already got. Let's start with the prospect list that you already have and how efficient you're being because it's a lot easier to close somebody that you've already got in front of you than it is to go find somebody new to get in front of you. But it's probably how do I get more people to talk to. Got it. So what do you do to keep fit and healthy? Well, I mentioned uh, ice hockey. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, really, I really do love it. I have a, a great time with that. And then I work out at home. I've got the whole home gym uh, set up to be able to do that. Um, I, I, I have to be careful because I travel a lot and airport food is not the best. Um, fortunately, I married a nutrition and food science major. So, uh, uh, and, and that means that I eat a lot of the same crap I always have, but now I feel guilty about it. <laughs> so, last question. What do you do each and every day to improve, whether in life or in business? You know, well, first of all, just a, a full disclaimer here. There, there are days when I do have to look at it and go, wow, did I really do anything to improve this day? Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the, the, the most important step for me is really to stay spiritually grounded. Um, I, I want to I live a, a complete life. I don't want to be just the sales guy. I don't want to be, you know, just anything. So I, I, it's, you know... It, for me, honestly, it's 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 checking in and asking the question every single day. Hey, God, am I where you want me to be? Very good. All right, Jeff, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been a great conversation. I loved it. That was really a lot of fun. Yeah, and I think the uh, hopefully the listeners pick something up out of it. Because remember, it's part of our job as salespeople to learn something new every day to make ourselves better at our job. And I want to thank our guest today, Jeff Shore, for helping us with that. Jeff, how can people learn more about you? Yeah, it's all at jeffshore.com. So it, it, you, you can find out how to connect with us on Twitter. We have a, a free Saturday morning uh, video newsletter. Uh, you can sign up at jeffshore.com. It's, it's, uh, it's all there, jeffshore.com. Perfect. So I said before, remember, it's your job. Learn something new every day. Hopefully we helped you achieve that today. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.